from around the globe, it's theCUBE with digital coverage of Red Hat Summit 2020, brought to you by Red Hat. Hi, and welcome back. I'm Stu Miniman. This is theCUBE's coverage of a Red Hat Summit 2020, bringing you guests from Red Hat, their partner ecosystem, practitioners, uh, where they are around the globe, bringing to them, them this digital event. And while uh, we wish we could all be together in person, we'll just be together apart for 2020. Uh, happy to welcome to the program a longtime Red Hatter, but first time on theCUBE, Rich Sharples, who's the Senior Director of Product Management inside Red Hat. Rich, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for the invitation, great to be here. All right, so uh, the topic we're going to talk about today is uh, something, you've got a long background in the middleware uh, space, uh, but it's uh, Quarkus. So uh, I, I personally was not familiar with Quarkus. Uh, obviously, we know, uh, God, I, I believe some Red Hatter told me once that there's like 2 million open source projects out there. So um, I, I believe I can be forgiven for not uh, having every one of them uh, memorized there. But uh, of course, anybody uh, in our community is uh, going to know Java. Uh, and what a huge impact that has had on the industry. I think you know Linux and Java, two of the you know major movers of how we you know build and uh, you know deal with applications today. So uh, give us a little bit uh, of a framework as to uh, what Quarkus is, you know, why it was created. Yeah. So it's it's no secret that um, as organizations and developers move to this kind of new style of cloud native development, developing. Uh, applications running in containers or in a kind of serverless environment, that Java is not necessarily the best fit. Java does many incredible things. It's an amazing field of engineering, but many of the, the, the cool things it does assumes it's going to be a long running application that can do all this cool dynamic class loading and dynamic optimization as the application runs. Um, those things are pretty impressive, but they're also fairly, um, fairly heavyweight. And in a, in a kind of ephemeral environment, whether containers or functions of service, uh, you don't have long running applications um, and you can't make use of those things. So in a Java environment, you pay for those really cool features that you don't necessarily get any benefit from them. So yeah, what we're really trying to do with Quarkus is ensure developers can continue to use Quarkus. It's still the, you know, the, the dominant language for enterprise development, um, yet still get the benefits of these new architectures. So ensuring that, that Java continues to be uh, you know, uh, uh, performant and efficient in these new you know, constrained environments. Okay, excellent. So we're not calling it cloud native Java though, uh, right Rich? Uh, we're, we're, but we are bringing, uh, it's, if I heard you right, Java, uh, for things like containers, Kubernetes, I even heard functions as a service. So we're talking yeah. serverless, um, of course, uh, you know, OpenShift serverless, something uh, that, yep. that, that's being uh, talked about this week. Uh, so help us understand, you know, if, if Java was long in the tooth, uh, you know, what, what stays the same? What's different? Uh, how have people mm -hmm. been um, managing and, 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 you know, building applications in this environment? Because obviously, you know, we, we've been dealing with containers for a number of years now. So yeah. what have they been doing so far? And, uh, you know, why is Quarkus different from some of the alternatives that are out there? Yeah, and, and really the, the goal is to ensure it does stay, stay the same. It's not a different language. It's not a fork. It is Java. Um, you write your Java applications essentially the same way you used to write them. Uh, you may be using microservices or functions, so slight uh, yeah, difference in terms of the design. But it's, uh, you know, we want to ensure that you can bring your favorite uh, frameworks and libraries with you as well, uh, whether you're accessing databases or message brokers. Uh, we, we want to ensure that you can still use those technologies. So we're trying to bring a whole ecosystem with us, um, with, with Quarkus, so those things can run well in a you know, container or, or uh, serverless environment as well. And that's super important because the, the real benefit here is yeah, many organizations face the choice of, I want to develop cloud native, I want to develop functions, um, but I've got this huge investment in Java in terms of skills and you know, tools and tool chains. And I don't want to go learn a, a new language just because I need to you know, take advantage of these new environments. So yeah, we're essentially giving developers their cake and allowing them to eat it. So we're, we're trying to provide the best of both worlds. Uh, stick with the language you already know and you have lots of experience with 
you know, still be able to get the benefits of running in a, a containerized environment. Okay, uh, Rich, what are some of the challenges here? So, you know, from an infrastructure standpoint, my background is, you know, virtualization broke a lot of pieces and containerization did the same thing. As you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, things, you know, spin up really fast and they don't stay on nearly as long. You know, if you, God, you mentioned functions in the service, uh, often we're measuring things in milliseconds. So everything changes yeah. to how I understand mm -hmm. what's up, how do I manage it, how do I monitor it, uh, all of those pieces. So, you know, I understand you're saying we we take the the skill set and what we know, but uh, you know th there there's got to be some on ramp here and uh, some consideration uh, for, for yeah, the so, yeah absolutely so so red red hat's taken on the on the on, on ramp we're ensuring that this ecosystem moves moves with us uh, we do a lot of the hard work within Quarkus so developers don't have to um, we do some very very clever stuff that. You know, very few organizations would be able to do because they don't have the the depth of knowledge of the Java virtual machine that we do. Um, we're we're able to take um, you know, a lot of things that you would normally do at startup once only, like you know loading classes and you know building kind of in memory data array, all all, all the kind of you're reading configurations, all of the things applications do once and only once. Uh, why do it at runtime? Why not build that into the compile time? You're going to do it once, but take it out of your runtime environment completely. So, yeah, in many ways, we're we're having to kind of rethink the way you know applications run. We have to having to do a reset on. Well, Java was built for this environment of long running applications, where if the application took ten minutes to load up all this data and, and classes and config, it didn't really matter because it was going to run for thirty six months. Um, got to do a reset on those those um, design decisions and think very very differently. Uh, and given with our deep experience with with containers and you know, working on things like native serverless um, and our deep deep roots in Java, we're we're able to do that and really think differently. So Quarkus takes a lot of the a lot of that kind of um, work away from developers. They don't think too much about it, um, and. By and large, what they can do is, is focus on their applications and their microservices, and we do all of that wiring and optimization for them, uh, and hopefully deliver some you know, real significant improvements, both in developer productivity, but also the kind of runtime resource utilization as well to really lower costs. Okay, and, and Rich, what's it's great. That's been really the nirvana when you talk about developers is they don't want to have to think about uh, some of that underlying, you know, gobbledygook. Uh, that that's why you know the, the term serverless is uh, so polarizing, is because from a developer standpoint, I don't want to think about this, but everybody screams. But there are servers, and there is networking, and there's you know things underneath that I need to think about. Um, so what is the underlying assumption here? We, we talked about you know, containers, uh, Kubernetes, functions as a service. Um, what integration is done there? Does this live across? Is it kind of like, you know, does it sit just on RHEL and therefore everywhere that RHEL lives, it's there? Or help me understand uh, kind of what that, uh, that underlying you know, substrate is. Yeah, right now our focus is, is RHEL x86, because um, that's the kind of dominant uh, platform in the cloud. Um, it, it is just Java, so we have that natural kind of portability. And you know, as as other architectures become important, we can certainly uh, look at those as well. Um, the the reason why the underlying machine architecture is important is because one of the one of the the options you have with Quarkus is actually to be able to compile everything down to a, a binary executable. Right? Um, that that may give you some additional. Uh, footprint reduction and performance enhancements. Uh, and obviously if we compile down to native, we do need to think about the underlying operating system and architecture. But by and large, as a developer, you, you really don't have to care, um, just like you don't have to care with Java today. Uh, you also have the option with, um, with Quarkus um, to run on conventional JVM, uh, OpenJDK uh, is our preference. And if you can run on OpenJDK, then you can pretty much run anywhere. Um, and there are, and there are you know, different reasons for, for compiling down a native versus running on a, a, a traditional uh, JDK, different optimizations, different trade-offs you would, you would likely make. All right. Um, so 
Rich, uh, an open source project here. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, who's contributed to this? Um, you know, what general adoption is this? And, uh, you know, where are we uh, with the solution today? Is it is it today ready for uh, production environments? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's getting close to production ready. Yeah, we'll we'll be uh, uh, making this uh, generally available uh, yeah, during summit and. Many of the components we we use are tried and tested. Again, we're we're not we're not reinventing everything from the ground up. We 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 leverage things like RLVM, we leverage uh, OpenJDK, we leverage all the all of the frameworks and libraries that developers are familiar with. Um, we just have to optimize them for for focus. So yeah, much of this is is not brand new technology. It's the the existing technology that has that kind of maturity and tooling support. So yeah, we're, uh, we're confident it's production ready. One of the, um, the early stages of the, the development of Caucus was to uh, use, use some of Red Hat's own products as guinea pigs, um, actually, you know, um, optimize those products for containerized environments by, by uh, rebuilding them on top of Caucus. And that gave us obviously a lot of insight into the general readiness, uh, you know, the whole kind of a eating your own, uh, own dog food um, principle. Um, in, in terms of the, you know, uh, the organizations um, in the investing in caucus, uh, you know, we have this kind of old, old adage we, we often use at Red Hat, which is, you know, if you wanna, if you wanna move quickly, uh, go alone. If you wanna go far, then go with others. Uh, we're at the stage where we've been developing caucus very, very rapidly. And that's mostly been a Red Hat effort. Um, we, we've certainly got some help from from the mothership uh, IBM, and I expect that to uh, you know, increase over time. Uh, and we're now at the point where we have a you know, generally available product uh, coming up, and we're ready to really kind of expand the ecosystem. So um, we, we're you know, looking for you know, um, whether you're a um, a framework uh, provider. You, you know, you've, you've written a framework for Java and you want to have that quarkified and ensure that runs really well and part of the, the, the kind of growing ecosystem around Quarkus. We're looking for that. We're looking for you know, cloud providers to you know, take this technology and, and see how it runs in their environments and give us feedback. So yeah, definitely looking to expand that, uh, that, uh, that ecosystem of contributors so we can you know, really turn this into a, a kind of de facto uh, technology for the cloud. Yeah, so Rich, step back for us for a second. You, you've got a long history with Java. You know, why in 2020 is, you know, Java still, I believe it's like number two on, 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 the, uh, uh, on, on the language list there. Why is it so important today? And why is moving forward uh, to all of these cloud solutions uh, so important for, uh, for that ecosystem? Yeah, I, I think it comes down to you know, organizations are faced with a tough choice. Do they stick with the, the language they know and love, which is Java? The language they've developed applications for the last decade, um, and not be able to take the best advantage of a cloud native or a serverless environment, or do they go learn a new language, um, GoLang or Node.js, and you know kind of hunt around and try and see if that has the same kind of ecosystem uh, and, and support? So we want to give organisations a better choice, which is you can stick with a language you already know and love, and you have the skills. And the resources, um, yeah, you can still take advantage of um, these these new environments, and that, that's you know, I mean, fundamentally, the problem we're trying to solve for our customers. Um, that's why open source projects are uh, they 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 live or live or die depending on if they really do scratch an itch, uh, you know, fulfill a need with uh, with real developers, and we think we've uh, certainly from the adoption and the interest we've seen with Caucus, we really do think we found a. a, a a very real problem to to solve. Yeah, uh, Rich. Uh, be, before we wrap up, uh, just want to give you the opportunity. You know, how, how's your team's doing? I think you know Red Hat's uh, making a real concerted effort to take uh, you know a, 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 a appropriate tone uh, for the event this mm -hmm. week, uh, trying to make sure it's not you know uh, some of the usual uh, glam uh, that we normally uh, expect to see pulling the community all together. Um, but you know the community is so important, and 
you know, the, the network of people uh, that, you know, build not only, you know, technologies, but yeah. careers and, uh, you know, relationships. So uh, mm -hmm. give us a little insight as to how, how, how your team's doing and responding in these yeah. challenging times. I, I think this is a good, uh, another good example of where, where open source really does show its resilience. Uh, open source projects are typically very, very distributed. Um, no open source projects rely on an office being open. Um, so, you know, we're a distributed team. We're all used to work using distributed tools across the world, different time zones. It's kind of natural for us. So we're kind of plugging on, you know, just as we have done in the past, uh, you know, a few more dogs in the background and crying babies. And, you know, we're all humans. We all tolerate that. Um, we have great support from our, our leadership, both at uh, Red Hat and IBM. Um, you know, they're, they're very clear that they put people and families before, you know, before revenue. And that's, that's good to know. Um, everybody's, you know, you know, continuing as they can um, to you know, ensure that we have uh, you know, great technology out there. Because uh, like I say, there's a, there's a there's real demand here that needs to be filled and we're, we're going to continue doing that. So, yeah, everybody's kind of holding up pretty well. Uh, so let's just see how long this thing goes on. But, but again, I, I do think it's a, it is a, a valuable um, kind of lesson on the, 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 the resilience of distributed teams and open source in particular. Um, so, yeah. All right. Well, well, thank you for that, Rich. Uh, just uh, to, to, to bring it on home, uh, the, as you said, the, the general availability of Quarkus uh, you know, is, is in front of us here, uh, really expecting the, the ecosystem and customers move. Uh, give us a little bit of what we should be looking at going forward. Uh, what are some of the uh, kind of maturity steps and uh, what should we expect to see through the remainder of 2020? Yeah, it's going to be a pretty exciting year. I mean, given the, the, the changes we've, we, we're we all going through, we are going to try and you know, come meet developers where they are, which is, you know, on their laptops and in front of their computers. So we're going to do, uh, we're, we're planning to do a bunch of, um, you know, kind of very quick webinars, you know, quick five-minute takes on you know, interesting features. We're going to do some, um, some virtual hackathons as well, so you can actually get keyboard time and talk to some experts. We have a platform for doing that. So pretty excited. We, you know, again with the with the internet, we can we can reach uh, a lot of uh, developers very easily. Um, actually, far more than we could at uh, a live event like Summit. So we're gonna we're gonna make the best of it and try and get out to as many developers as, as we can with Caucus. And um, you know, uh, hopefully they'll repay us by investing a little bit of time into it and um, giving us some feedback and uh, you know trying some applications and you know. See how it goes. All right, uh, and uh, you know, final final question for you, Rich. You know, Quarkus. I, I have to imagine that the quark, the subatomic particle, uh, you know, came into the naming. There is there there's some connection with that. Um, you know, what, what I guess why, why why the name for the project? Yeah, that, I mean that's pretty much it. Yeah, the the, the quark is uh, yeah kind of well, uh, arguably the uh, smallest fundamental uh, uh, particle. Uh, yeah, until we find something physics. smaller. Well. The, the, the potential is something smaller, but that's kind of in the realm of uh, quantum mechanics and physics, which I'm not an expert on. So, but yeah, it's it's meant to mean small. Um, and the the US bit, US bit, uh, I'd like to think there was a, a really good deep meaning around that. Uh, the meaning is that uh, we understand that trying to get any kind of uh, um, brand leadership or trademark protection on a well-known term like Quark is impossible. So we had to add something to Quark. And uh, Quark is kind of sound cool. <laughs> All right. Well, Rich Sharples, uh, pleasure to catch up with you. Uh, congrats on the progress uh, for, for Quark. Is definitely look forward to watching its progression in the future. Thanks. Great talking to you. All right. I'm Stu Miniman. Lots more coverage here at Red Hat Summit 2020. Thank you, as always, for watching theCUBE.